and gentlemen. We're going to get started. My name is Alexander Osinga, and I'll be guiding you through today's webinar, Option Strategies for Your New Year Resolution. I'm pleased to welcome our presenters today, OIC's very own Ed Mondla and Bill Ryan. Ed is the Manager of Investor Services at the Options Clearing Corporation. He began his career with Hall Trading in 1997, where he served as a market maker for index options. Ed was a highly successful professional trader for many years in the equities, options, and futures markets before entering the service side of the industry. Bill Ryan is a Senior Investor Services Specialist with the Options Industry Council and has been involved in the futures and options industry for more than 25 years. His experience extends to all aspects of the options business, working the buy side, sell side, exchange side, and clearing side. He formerly held multiple trading licenses during his options career and has worked for OIC's investor services team since 2000. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Ed Modla will bring you our topic today, option strategies for your New Year's resolution. Ed? Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, we're going to pick up uh, from last week's presentation on the basics and fundamentals and take things one step further and discuss some commonly used strategies um, to uh, emphasize what Alex talked about. First things first, our disclaimer, options are not suitable for everyone. Options are a complex investment tool and a deep and thorough understanding of options is required before using them in a live account. The options disclosure document, otherwise known as the characteristics and risks of standardized options, is required reading material before you can get approval to trade in a live account. If you don't have a copy of that booklet, contact your brokerage firm. We will have examples today, uh, computations involving profits and losses. Those examples will not include the costs of commissions, fees, margins, and taxes. Those are important costs in a live account, but we'll keep things simple today and leave those costs out. Also, we'll discuss several different strategies today. Uh, these are not an advocation for those strategies or a recommendation to use them. Uh, we are picking a handful of strategies for illustrative and educational purposes only. The Options Industry Council offers free and unbiased education to the public. Funding comes from the OCC, or the Options Clearing Corporation. If you haven't already done so, please check out and make use of our website, optionseducation.org. We have plenty of written educational material, including online courses, dozens of thorough pages on strategies, and of course, we offer webinars, multiple sessions every month that we encourage you to attend. And the OCC uh, is the funding for OIC. They are the clearing organization managing risk and the backbone of the options industry. Uh, the exchanges also support what we do here at OIC, and here are the parent exchanges on the board. And this is where the action takes place. The exchanges are the ones who are deciding what equities get listed options contracts, what strike prices are made available, and these are where the executions take place. Uh, any order that you put in through your platform is going to ultimately end up at an exchange where executions take place between buyers and sellers. All of these exchanges, along with the Options Industry Council and the Clearing Corporation, would like to see the industry thrive and grow, which it has. Here's a chart annually of total volume in contracts uh, with the numbers on the left representing billions of contracts. You can see at the turn of the century, there was a sharp uptick in volume that we saw, and there's a multitude of reasons for that. A couple to point out. First of all, electronic trading greatly enhanced the access that investors had to the markets, uh, but also the awareness and the knowledge level about options. Back in the 90s and 80s, not too many people were aware uh, or familiar with what options contracts were all about. There was a myth for a long time that options were too risky for an individual investor. Uh, but as the investing public became more sophisticated and realized the value of options, they dispelled that myth, and we see options being traded in much, much greater numbers. Uh, even last year, 2017, in what was a historically low volatility environment, we still saw 16 million contracts a day get put up in this uh, industry, and that puts us at $4, four billion for the year. To, be, to begin 2018, we are off to a record pace for the month. We haven't closed January yet. But tremendous volume uh, we've seen so far in the first three weeks of 2018. So in this environment, to see that volume is very encouraging for the industry, and we expect that trend to continue. Our presentation outline today is going to begin with a brief recap of last week. For those of you who are very new to options or may have missed last week's session, we'll just spend a few minutes going back through the absolute most key and crucial 
terms and concepts that you need to understand as we get through our strategies today. And then we will proceed uh, to discuss four strategies. Uh, I'll take the first couple, covered calls and cash secured puts, the dynamics and the risk profile of those and a comparison between the two. And then I'll turn things over to my colleague, Bill Ryan, to uh, discuss the protective puts and the collar. Now, there will be some redundancy in what you hear today compared to what you heard last week and maybe even some redundancy between what I say and what Bill says later on here today, but that's not by accident. Uh, Options education is about repetition, driving concepts home again and again until uh, they become second nature and become part of your toolbox. So we'll begin with the options basics. And again, this is a recap from last week, the most basic terminology. Options are traded on an exchange, executed at the exchange level between a buyer and a seller. Uh, The buyer is paying the option premium up front, and now they own the right to execute a transaction in an underlying asset. That would mean buying or selling. And in our case today, with our examples today, that would be shares of stock. The other side of that transaction is the seller. Paid the premium up front, non-refundable, cash goes right into their account, and in exchange for that payment, they take on the obligation to potentially be required to execute a transaction in shares of stock. Whether you're buying or selling depends on what type of option you have traded, and the price and the expiration date will be defined. The option contract itself will identify what price this potential transaction in shares could take place at, and it will also define how long this right and obligation exists. Uh, The price of the option is derived between market participants uh, who agree on a fair price for the option, but all of these components play a role. The variables involved include, of course, stock price, but also the strike price within the option, the specified price, the days to expiration, and a, a combination or analysis of all of these different variables will give you an option premium, and market participants then can execute transactions. The key takeaway here is buyers pay for rights and sellers are paid to take on obligations. Now I said, how do you know if you're buying or you're selling based on the transaction you make? Depends what type of option you trade. There are call options and there are put options or equity and ETF options, and that's what we're gonna talk about here today. The underlying asset that will be purchased or sold is 100 shares of stock or ETF. This means you can either buy a call, buy a put, sell a call, or sell a put. Those are the four sides that you can trade. The entire universe of options strategies consists of those sides, either outright by themselves or a combination of those sides together or including a stock position. But those four sides are what makes up the entire universe of strategies that you can use in the options space. Let's break down those four sides. This is a very useful uh, slide and graph for beginners to remember rights and obligations. If you are a call buyer or a put buyer, you are known as being long the contract. You're the holder, you're the buyer, you're being long the contract. If you are the seller or the writer of the option, you are short the contract. Don't let that confuse you with being long or short the market. More traditionally, being long is associated with being long the market trying to capitalize on a move higher. And being short It's synonymous with being short the market, trying to capitalize on a move lower or a bearish outlook. Those terms mean something differently when we're talking about trading options. Long simply means you bought or you own a contract, and short means you've sold or you've written a contract. If you purchased a call option, you have paid for the right to buy 100 shares of stock at a strike price, and you own that right any time up to and including expiration day. If you bought a put option, you've paid for the right to sell shares of stock at a particular price at any time up to and including expiration day. Brokerage firms accept exercise instructions from their clients up to a cutoff time on expiration day. It's different from firm to firm, but it's very important that you know what time that is and what method of communication your brokerage firm will accept. Options officially cease to exist at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time on their expiration date, but you do not have up until that time to communicate your instructions to your broker if you have to do so. On the short side, if you're an option seller selling a call option, you are paid the option premium and are taken on the obligation to sell shares of stock at a particular price for a specified time frame. And for a put option, if you've sold it, you're paid premium up front 
and you are now under the obligation to potentially be required to buy shares of stock for a certain length of time. Each one of these could be a strategy all by themselves. And for some of you that are a little familiar with these strategies, selling a call option, for example, is widely regarded as the most risky options trade you can do. Uh, but any of these can be an outright strategy, and we'll actually discuss shorting a put option very shortly. Now I'll move on to our first strategy for today, the covered call trade, and we will start with its definition. A covered call includes two pieces, writing or selling a call contract and buying shares of stock. Now these ratios have to match up. Our obligation by selling the call option is to sell 100 shares of stock, which means we need to own those shares, 100 shares of them. For each 100 shares owned, you would sell one call contract in order to construct the covered call trade. So you are committing yourself to selling shares at a certain price. These are shares that you already own, and you're comfortable with that price you're committing yourself to sell your shares at. In doing so, you're paid upfront option premium. Let's clean up some terminology. You may hear this strategy about used with different names, the covered right or the buy right. Now, the buy right is a very popular term, which specifies that both of these transactions occur at the same time. You are selling a, a call option and buying shares of stock simultaneously. That's the buy right. And you can do that with your brokerage firm in your trading platform at one singular price. For example, if you are buying shares at 70 and selling a call option for $1.50, you should be able to go into your brokerage firm's trading platform, enter an order to buy at 70, sell at $1.50, and that comes out to a net debit of 68.50, and that would be your order. Buy shares, sell to open a call option, price net debit 68.50, and if that trade is executed, you will have bought shares and sold equity call contracts at the same time. Uh, the fill prices you see in your account may not exactly be $70 and $1.50, but the net between the two uh, should be $68.50. Of course, that excludes commissions. Another term you might see is overwrite, uh, or some actually consider the traditional covered call if you already own the stock. It's in your account, and at some point later in time, you decide to write or sell a call option. So those are the different terminologies that you might see regardless of what term we're using uh, they all include buying 100 shares and selling one call contract or doing that ratio, buying 500 shares and selling five contracts and keeping that equivalency. The motivations, what is the, the primary goals and the advantages to doing this trade? Well, it starts with generating income on a stock position that you believe may not be moving too much in the near future. You are selling call premium in order to generate income in the account and enhance your returns. Of course, there's a market forecast that comes along with any options strategy, and in this case, the forecast would be neutral to bullish, maybe more on the moderately bullish side. The point is you, you don't think you're going to earn too much on your stock position. You're not bearish, but instead of watching a stock position that consolidates and maybe doesn't return anything or very, very small returns, you add some return to your account by selling a call option, which is yours to keep. So generating income, increasing returns, being consistent with a neutral to moderately bullish forecast, that's the ideal situation. Selling a call option against the stock position also lowers your break-even point, and that's because of that additional income that was generated. Specifically, it lowers your break-even point by the amount of premium received, and you'll see that in our example later. When we put numbers on the board, the call premium has limited downside benefits, and that is going to increase the likelihood of success of your trade, reducing your break-even point, You've generated income. It's consistent with your forecast. These are all advantages and reasons why the covered call is used. Of course, not all good. With any strategy, there's advantages and disadvantages. So what do we give up, or what are the negatives to this strategy? It starts with the realization that as a call writer, we have obligations now. We have to sell those shares at the strike price if the option buyer chooses to purchase them from us. We don't have a choice in the matter. We can't request to be assigned or to not be assigned. If we're assigned, we have to sell those shares, and we have to accept that as part of this trade. 
If we're assigned, those shares will be taken away from us. There are ways to manage the position and different things you can do, but we're not going to get into those uh, details today. As the trade is constructed, uh, we are under the obligation to sell. Also, equity options are American style. That has nothing to do with geography. Uh, what it means is these options can be assigned. Exercise and assignment activity can take place on any trading day up to and including expiration. Option sellers are constantly evaluating the likelihood of being assigned early. In the case of uh, call options, generally, that is if you have sold an option on a stock that pays a dividend and the option is in the money, uh, then the option holder, who isn't entitled to a dividend, may have incentive to exercise early just prior to the X date uh, for that dividend payment and buy shares. Uh, that's an example of when we see early assignment activity. In return for that obligation and potentially giving up your shares, of course, you are paid premium up front. That was the idea behind doing the trade in the first place, generate extra income, and understand that we may have to give up our shares. Different option strategies have all these various terms. I'm sure you've seen them out there, straddles and strangles and butterflies, and they tend to have some meaning or uh, tie a relationship into the trade itself. And the covered call is no different. The term covered comes from a few different places. We know that we're obligated to sell shares. If we already own those shares, then effectively the 100 shares of stock that we own serves as collateral for the short call obligation, or you could say the long stock covers the short call obligation. Also, uh, if we sold a naked call that was not covered and we didn't own the shares, we would have a tremendous amount of risk. We would be obligated to sell shares that we don't already own. That has unlimited uh, loss potential. Since we own the shares, that loss is now covered. The loss on the call to the upside is covered by the stock gain if the stock continues to rally. Upside potential loss for an uncovered call is unlimited, but with the shares, as the stock rallies above our strike price, the call will lose money, the shares we own will make money, and those will offset each other. Now let's get to some P&L graphs and make a comparison. Long stock versus the covered call. These graphs, of course, on the uh, horizontal axis represent the stock price. The vertical axis are profit and loss. On the, on the long stock side of things, our entry point, our profit and loss is zero. Uh, on the covered call, look at our entry point. We have a, an actual gain there. That's the call premium uh, that we've generated, and that gives us a profit if the stock doesn't move. And that's what I referred to earlier as an increased likelihood of success on this trade because we have that extra premium in the account. If the stock starts to move lower, the downside looks similar. That's because we own shares of stock on both sides. So the, um, the construction of these graphs look very similar, but the covered call to the downside, even though it loses, will outperform the long stock position because of that call option premium that we received. On the other side, to the upside, the long stock position would outperform the covered call as we get above the strike price. That tilt where the covered call levels off, that happens right at our strike price where we are obligated to sell our shares. As we go above that, the long stock position would continue to profit. The covered call does not. That's what we give up. So let's go through an example with numbers and see if we can clear some of those things up. If a lot of that sunk in for people and some of it didn't quite all right, Maybe the example will clear some things up. So the investor here owns 100 shares trading at 52. So in this case, we are not executing both sides simultaneously. We are going to sell a call option against shares that we already own, and we're long those shares at 52. Here's our forecast. We're neutral to moderately bullish over the next few months. So we're not bearish, but we don't think we'll make a whole lot of money on the shares that we own. We want to generate some extra income. And we have a target sale price. We've forecasted where we think this stock will go, and we're comfortable with a particular sales price to the upside. These conditions are ideal to establish a, co a covered call example or covered call position. So we will sell a three-month 55-strike price call option at $1.75. That brings in $175 to our account. We are obligated to sell the shares at 55 in this case, and we're comfortable with that. We've taken on that obligation and gotten paid to do so. 
Now, one of the most valuable things that you can do or learn how to do is draw a simple profit and loss graph for a strategy that you're looking to evaluate. When I started in the business over 20 years ago, I learned this right away. Simple math and simple arithmetic uh, that will help you draw a graph and analyze a trade. You start by taking the stock price at expiration and uh, forecasting at different levels of the stock what the net profit or loss would be. I'll just point out it has to be the stock price at expiration. It cannot be a stock price prior to expiration. The reason for that is uh, we don't know what the option is going to be worth prior to expiration. There's volatility in the marketplace. There's time value of the option. So you cannot say for sure what the option will be worth prior to expiration. But at expiration, we know. We know exactly what it'll be worth, only its intrinsic value. So we can choose a stock price, for example, the unchanged level of 52, and just simply calculate. What did we make on the stock? What did we make on the option? And what's the net profit? In this case, the stock didn't move from where we bought it, 52. We make nothing. The option is out of the money. We sold it for $1.75. It expires out of the money and worthless. So we profited $1.75. That leaves us with a net profit of $1.75. We made money on a stock that didn't go anywhere. I'll ask this question and pause for a few seconds while you think about it. What stock price at expiration will be my break-even point where my net profit and loss is zero? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it, and then we'll put the rest of the numbers on the board. Okay, let's take a look at the rest of these numbers. To the downside, if the stock were to fall to 50, you see what the numbers look like. Hopefully, the answer to my question um, a lot of you hopefully got the right answer. The answer would be 50 and a quarter or 50 spot 25. If that was the case, we would have lost $1.75 on the stock, gained $1.75 from the option, and broken even if the stock drops $1.75. That's another uh, point of emphasis on how the covered call increases the chances of success on your trade. The stock drops a few points and we still break even. So you can calculate these number of stocks all the way down to 40. We continue to lose on the stock. We can't make any more money on the option. So the net profit and loss on the covered call position will continue to experience greater and greater losses to the downside, but will always outperform the long stock position outright. On the upside, if the stock rallies sharply up to 60, for example, we profited $8 on the stock, we lost 325 on the option. Where does that come from? We had the stock expiring at 60. We sold an option at the 55 strike. That means it's $5 in the money. It's worth five. We sold it for $1.75. That's a loss of 325. Add those numbers together. That gets us $4.75. And here's what we give up. If that stock keeps rallying, up to 62, 65, 68. A long stock position will continue to profit in greater numbers. The covered call position will not. 475 is our maximum gain. We'll see that on our P&L graph, these numbers that we just talked about. The break-even point is calculated by taking our entry point on the stock, 52, and subtracting the call premium of $1.75. Maximum gain at 55 and above and that's reaching our strike price and going beyond it. Risk profile to the downside looks similar, uh, but risk profile to the upside a bit different, and that's the, the covered call example. Now let's move on to strategy number two, and we'll draw some comparisons between these as we go through this. The cash secured put, uh, this is one of the strategies I referred to at the beginning as an outright strategy. There's only one piece to this strategy, no combination of options, no stock position involved at all. The cash secured put involves writing or selling a put option contract. Now, we know that we're paid up front and we're under the obligation to purchase shares when we do this. So when we execute this strategy, we set aside an appropriate amount of cash or uh, the correct amount of cash to buy the shares if we have to because we're under the obligation to have to. Uh, that cash amount will be equal to the strike price. If we sold a uh, put option at a strike price of 30 and we're assigned, we have to pay 30 times 100 or $3,000 in order to buy those shares. We need to have that amount of funds in our account at our disposal. So that is what we need to have on hand. And that amount can potentially include the premium we received for selling the put in the first place. Uh, but we need to have that cash in case we're assigned. We can earn money on the cash that we've set aside. Uh, that's an advantage of keeping cash instead of buying shares outright. Usually, 
Um, selling a, a cash secured put involves selling at the money or out of the money options, but in the money can also certainly be used. The term buy right is there for those of you who are a little bit more familiar with these strategies and on the more intermediate level. Uh, the reference there is this, the buy right is traditionally done using an out of the money call option. And if you were to compare the risk profile of doing the buy right with an out of the money call against selling an in the money put, you'd see the risk profile is exactly the same. Now there's differences between the two trades, of course. The amount of commissions paid might be different. The execution prices available to you in the open market might be different. Uh, but from a risk profile perspective, the buy right using an out of the money call and selling an in the money put option, again, at the same strike price, the same exact strike price used on both of these, those are equivalent to each other. And that's something to, to keep in mind for your future studies. If you're not familiar with that already, it's a very interesting dynamic and it helps explain how options prices keep each other in line. If that wasn't the case, there'd be an arbitrage opportunity and those prices would get kicked right back into line. And when you sell a cash secured put, assignment is potentially what you want to have happen. We might want to buy those shares. We just don't want to buy them at their current levels. Instead of working a limit order to buy those shares in the open market, we sell a put option and take on an obligation and get paid to do so and keep cash on the side. So we could buy shares below market levels, earn interest on the cash we set aside, and earn some income by selling the put option in the first place. The motivation behind this trade acquire shares behind below market value. That's what we're going to focus on for this particular example. The motivation is we want shares below their current level, which is $50 a share. That's where the market is right now in this example. We forecast that the stock is going to drop by about 10% into the mid to low 40s within the next few months and then return to current levels. We could work a limit order to buy those shares and then watch the market to see if that order gets filled or we could sell a put option at that level and get paid for that put option and put ourselves under the obligation to have to buy those shares. More specific numbers to this one, we look out two months and we find the 45 put, that's 10% below where it's currently at, trading at $2. We're gonna go ahead and sell that put option. The maximum gain that we could possibly make on this trade all by itself would be the $2 that we sold the option for. That does not include the potential gain if we end up with a long stock position. Just on this isolated trade alone, we can only make $2. The risk, worst case scenario, is if the stock drops all the way down to zero. If that happens, stock drops down to zero, we would then be required to pay $45 or 4500 minus the $2 we got up front, and we would potentially stand to lose $4,300. It looks like a risk-reward ratio that's a bit off, but again, this is, a, this is an alternative to going ahead and buying, 50, uh, buying 100 shares at 50, which is where it's currently trading, and risking 5,000. Selling a put option, generating some income, trying to buy the stock lower, and having a max risk that's lower than buying 100 shares at the current levels. Margin is up to your brokerage firm. We're just going to put out an example um, for you uh, for reference purposes, but each brokerage firm can set their own margin and toggle uh, toggle things to be more restrictive or more lenient. Uh, but for example, you may need $4,300 in your account in order to execute this trade. If we're assigned, we would need $4,500. If you had $4,300 and sold the option for $200, you would have that in your account. So uh, margin is here for illustrative purposes. Your brokerage firm will set that, but it might be around $4,300 that you would need. Break-even point would be the strike price minus what we received for that strike price. If we have to pay $45 a share, but we received $2 up front for that, our break-even is there at $43 a share, the, the strike price minus the premium. Here's our example. Uh, see the dashed line is the stock price graph, and here is our P&L graph for the cash secured put. If you remember the covered call graph, looks exactly the same. Same structure, same risk, same upside potential. The max profit occurs at a strike price of 45. If the stock rallies, we can't make any more money. If the stock drops, we have a long position in stock that we have to be concerned about, and that's where your risk is. So it's very interesting to see how this relates so closely to the covered call P&L graph. If the stock is below 45 at expiration, we will be fully expecting assignment. 
and we'll have to buy those shares at $45 a share. We were paid two up front, so we know our break-even is 43. Our new position is long stock. We don't have any options anymore. We are long stock, and P&L will then be determined by what happens with the stock price after we are assigned. There's our break-even point or cost basis or effective price. It's now $43, $7 lower from where it is right now. Um, but keep in mind the stock has dropped and we're buying into that weakness. The stock is above 45. Here's what the P&L graph looks like. The put would simply expire worthless out of the money. We keep the $2 or 200 that we sold the option for to begin with. We have no stock position. Uh, we have absolutely no position at all and we can reevaluate our market outlook and market opinion and decide do we want to sell another put option? Do we want to sell a different uh, strike price or the same strike? Or do we want to do a completely different trade? Uh, we have no position. We can reevaluate and make a decision from there. A few things to think about with this trade. Assignment is not guaranteed, which means a few things. I said that there's a comparison between doing this trade and using a limit order to buy shares. Well, there's a difference. It's very important. If you have a limit order in to buy shares at 45 and the stock trades to 45, you are going to get filled there. Uh, but with put options, it doesn't work like that. You have to be assigned, which means the stock really likely needs to be below 45 at expiration. This means the stock could drop below 45 and then rally sharply above 45 before you get assigned. You don't own the shares and you don't capitalize on the rally. So you may miss out on the buying opportunity. You also may end up paying a higher price if you chase the market. Remember, we wanted these shares. If the put option isn't giving it to us, we may have to go out and chase the shares higher and pay a higher price than we could if we just went outright and bought them today. So consider that if you're using this strategy. Also, if we're assigned, the new risk is in the long stock position, and that could be a very large risk. We have paid for those shares. That's a cash outlay. We are buying into weakness. Generally, that will be the case when you sell a put option. In our example, it definitely was. The stock would have dropped 10 or 12%, and then we'd be buying into that weakness and we'd have significant risk to the downside if shares continued to move lower. So there's our first two strategies of the day, and now we're gonna go through a few others, starting with the protective put, and I will turn this over for the rest of the presentation to my colleague, Bill Ryan. It's all yours, Bill. Thanks, Ed. Folks, we're talking about protective puts, and the first question people might have is, why would we want to buy a protective put? Well, an investor might be bullish on the stock, but they are looking for protection against a move to the downside. They are looking to establish a floor price at which they'll sell their stock. And my personal favorite for those investors that have, feel they are have an over-concentration in their particular security, their thought process here would be, we're going to take a little bit of money off the table. I'm going to maybe diversify or, or protect this large percentage or large portion of my portfolio. Here's an example of a protective put. We've got uh, world-famous company XYZ. It's trading at $65 a share. The investor is bullish on the stock. He owns it at 60, and they want to limit their downside risk. Again, remember, a put option gives the owner, the holder, the right, but not the obligation to sell the stock at the strike price in question at any point before the expiration. So our investor buys a three-month, $60 strike put option for a buck. All right, total premium paid there is, of course, $1 times the number of shares that underlie the contract, or the premium multiplier is 100. So uh, that's $100 that comes out of the stockholder's pocket. So what happens if an investor who owns the stock at 60 and buys a $60 put what happens with these different outcomes? Well, if we own the stock at 60 and at expiration the stock remains at 60, we have zero profit in our stock and our protective put is worthless. So we've lost a dollar on that. The benefit of the owning the protective put is should the stock decline to $55 a share, our $60 put is now worth $5. The stock that we bought at 60 is has lost $5. And even though we've experienced a sizable decline in the stock, 
our account looks pretty good. We're only down the premium that protection that we paid for, that $1. All right, this is the P&L diagram of our protective put. You can see the green dotted line. We own the stock at 60. It's currently trading at 65. Break even is our purchase price of the stock plus what we paid for that put option. So that's $60 for the stock, $1 for the put. Our break even for the long stock position is $61. The maximum loss for this trade is the premium we paid for the option, which is $1. Here's, a, here's an interesting example here of the stock, again, trading at $65. We are cautious on the stock. We own it at 60. The investor wants to limit their downside risk and they want to lock in profits. So with the versatility of options, we've got a plan. We've got a guy here who can figure out how to do this. So the investor buys a three-month $65 strike at a price of $2.50. That $65 strike, of course, matches the price of the stock. So our total premium paid is $2.50 times 100 or $250. And these are the results of this position at expiration. All right, we own the stock at 65. We bought the put at $2.50. I checked that, I'm sorry. We bought a $65 put. We own the stock at 60, 6 0. We bought the $65 put at $2.50. If the shares are trading below 65 at expiration, we exercise the put and we sell the stock at 65. Remember, we bought the stock at 60, we're selling it at 65, that's a $5 profit on the stock. However, we paid $2.50 for the premium uh, for that put option, so our net profit is $2.50 a share, $250. If the shares are above $65, the long put expires worthless, and of course we would never exercise an out-of-the-money put, and the profit remains in the long stock position. Again, we own that stock at 60 and it is trading above 65. The next strategy we're going to discuss is the options collar or the collar strategy. And the collar strategy is actually two of the strategies we've discussed today. It's the protective put on the downside. We buy a protective put. It's normally an out of the money put. And of course, as the owner of that put, it gives us the right to sell shares of stock at the strike price until the expiration of the contract. The other part of the strategy is uh, a covered call. We own the stock, we sell an out of the money call. In return for the premium, we take on the obligation to sell the shares if we are assigned. And as Ed mentioned earlier, we have put a limit, an upside cap on our stock position by selling that short call. And of course, this strategy does require owning the shares of stock. So the stock plays a part in both of the position, both of the option positions. So now we ask ourselves, why would I want to use a collar? Well, shareholders might have an unrealized gain on their stock position, much like we discussed earlier with our protective put, owning the stock at 60 and buying a $65 put and uh, they are looking for some downside protection. All right, that's the role of the long put. Uh, as far as selling the covered call, if we sell an out of the money call, we do get market participation on the upside up to the strike price of the call option that we sold. The benefits of using a collar is, or even utilizing the strategy, is it's quite likely that the put option will be fully or substantially paid for by the sale of the call premium, and the user of the collar strategy is going to have their objectives met if they are assigned on the upside or if they exercise their put and sell the stock on the downside. Before you implement a collar strategy, you do have to do a little bit of homework. When you buy your put option, you want to determine at what level you want your insurance to kick in. What price are you okay with? What price are you comfortable with in exercising your put? So we want to consider the time frame. I know many people who call into or contact us say, you know, how do I determine what expiration date I should use? And my 
typical response is you have to do your homework. If you own shares of stock and uh, they have a, an earnings announcement coming out in two months, well then, if you're looking to protect that stock, you might want to have a put option that will be in existence when this corporate event, when this earnings announcement come out. So that might help you determine what expiration date. Uh, as far as selling the covered call, that also requires some homework on the on the option trader's part. And selecting the strike price, first and foremost, you have to be comfortable with selling the stock at that strike in question. And we should also factor in corporate events. Again, if the company announces earnings and they're, they're off the charts, that stock could rise dramatically higher, and that could help guide you in determining or selecting a strike price. Quick note, if you are assigned on that call, it's not the end of the world. This is something that we knew going in. And if you do have your stock called away at that higher price, you've got a profit. And uh, that's a good thing. Again, remember, we have to factor in that we're paying premium and we're also receiving premium. The put premium that we pay is for protection to the downside. That helps us manage our downside risk. The call premium received and the strike price selected represent your potential upside reward. So now that we've defined the strategy, what's it cost? How much money is it going to cost? Well, it depends on the premium that changes hands. When we buy the put, in this case, we're, we're, doing, we're putting the collar on for a net debit. We're buying a put at $3, and we're selling a call at $2. Cost of that trade, the two option trades, is a buck. For a credit, and believe me, this can happen. Uh, when we sell the call, we take a credit. We receive $4 in premium. We also buy the out-of-the-money put for a dollar. Uh, the net credit in my account is going to be $3. And the final example here is where the premium we receive in the sale of the call is equal to the premium we pay for the purchase of the put. This is a zero-cost trade. In the industry, this is often referred to as a zero-dollar collar. This is a display of, of how this strategy would appear on a P&L. We own the stock at 61 and a half. We buy a $55 put at $1.52, and we sell a $65 strike call for the same dollar amount, $1.52. Net cost, zero. Now, there's, of course, there's going to be commission charge here. We're not going to factor that in just now. We're, we're just looking at the premiums only. So what happens if the shares close below $1.55? Well, we own the stock at 61 and a half. We have this $55 strike put that we own, and we sold the call at $1.52. If the stock closes below 55, the short $65 call expires worthless. We exercise our $55 put, and we sell the stock at 55 even. All right. Since we were long the stock at 61 and a half, and we sold it at 55, this is a worst-case scenario. We've lost as much as we could lose on this trade with the collar. Uh, we maximum lost $6.50 a share, or $650 for the trade. Now, what happens if the stock closes in between our $55 put strike and our $65 call strike? We're long the stock at 61 and a half. We own the 5.5 put, and we sold the 65, 6.5 call. If the stock is in between those strikes, in between 55 and 65, both options expire worthless, and our P&L is based strictly on the long stock position. And on the upside, what happens if the shares close above $65 a share? We own the stock, again, 61 and a half. We've got our $55 put that we purchased, financed by the sale of the $65 call. The long $55 put is of zero value at expiration because the stock is trading above 65. Nobody's going to want to sell stock at 55 when you can sell it a good $10 higher or so. The $65 call that we sold short, however, is almost certainly going to be exercised. And in this example, we have been assigned. We are on the hook. We are required to sell 65 shares. I'm sorry, we are required to sell 100 shares of stock at $65 a share. We own the stock at 61 and a half. Remember, we put on our $0 collar. We sold the stock at 65, and there's our maximum profit of 350. Folks, I got to tell you that the options education program that is offered by 
the OIC is the perfect place to brush up your knowledge, increase your knowledge, and test yourself. We have podcasts, webcasts, online courses, strategy articles, position simulators, just about everything you need to get pointed in the right direction. And if you have any questions about options and options trading, you're certainly welcome to contact us. Alex, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Bill. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a few questions today, but I'd like to uh, remind our listeners that if you have um, further questions about the concepts we discussed today or the tools on the OIC website, or if we weren't able to get to your question you submitted, you can contact our investor services team at options at the OCC.com. That's options with an S at the OCC.com. They're ready to help answer any questions about option strategies or positions. And with that, Bill, I have um, a question for you. Let's say a buyer wants to exercise a contract that isn't in the money in order to recoup some of the loss for the premium. Can you be assigned even if the underlying never meets the strike price? Well, a, an option holder can exercise a contract regardless of where the underlying security is. It usually doesn't make a lot of financial sense to exercise an out-of-the-money options contract. Although it happens, I think it's a rare occurrence, it's most likely to occur when the stock is trading exactly at or on either side of that strike price in question. We refer to that as pin risk. The stock gets pinned right to the price of the options contract that you have a position in. Great. Thank you. Ed, if I combined both covered calls in cash-secured puts, what would that be? I like this question. Uh, a combination of those strategies in one uh, would be uh, being long shares of stock, short an out-of-the-money call, and short an out-of-the-money put. Uh, that by itself is a, a common strategy that is widely used, uh, which has a few different names. We refer to it on our website as the covered strangle, uh, but it's also just as commonly referred to as the covered combination, uh, and that is enhanced income generation. Selling options on either side of your entry point on the stock, generating income from two different options. Uh, certainly when you do this type of strategy, it's imperative to understand what assignment means. You have two obligations. Uh, potentially on the upside to sell the shares that you own and lose those shares in your account. To the downside, if you're assigned on a put, you would be obligated to buy even more shares. Uh, depending on the ratio, you might be doubling your position or, or just adding some number of shares to it. But regardless, you have two obligations on either side. You're generating extra income. What I would encourage uh, the, the person who asked this question and others who are interested in this, on our strategy section on the optionseducation.org website, um, the strategies and advanced concepts, we do have a full strategy page that discusses the covered strangle. Um, it's listed on that list of about three dozen or so different strategies as the covered strangle. We have a P&L graph along with the description of the motivation behind the trade, the risks that you need to be aware of. If you have questions about that, you can certainly send us an email. We'd be glad to help you out. But that's, that's a really good question and a good strategy that we see used, and we actually discuss that on a lot of our webinars and our broadcasts here through OIC. Great. Thank you, Ed and Bill. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time today. While we weren't able to get to all your questions, we have our investor services team ready to help. Feel free to reach out to them at options at the OCC.com. Many of you asked about further education. Please visit optionseducation.org and see the Getting Started section for further reading. And as Bill mentioned, you can also access OIC's My Path assessment to gauge your options knowledge and receive a custom learning program for you to advance your investing skills. And of course, make sure to check out the website for upcoming events. Thank you again for uh, attending, and we hope to see you again next month.